Well, shall we? Uh, Stairs, that does not fit the seat. All right, let's get comfortable in there. Good morning. Good morning to the audience here at the Morton Auditorium at GW and to our online streaming audience. Uh, we welcome you all to GME. Where do we go from here? An important topic, and I think uh, you wouldn't be here in the room or online if you didn't think so. Uh, I want to very much thank the uh, Association of Academic, uh, Academic Health Centers, Steve Wardman, the CEO, who will be talking to you shortly, uh, as our colleagues in, in uh, hosting this uh, 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 seminar, this symposium, this morning together, and Kristen uh, Verdanami, who is the um, real backbone behind this. Thank you, Kristen. Good job. So <clears throat> the question of GME is one that uh, perhaps doesn't get as much airtime as it would. I find that in talking to the person on the street and talking to somebody who's not inside medical education, there's a sort of a vagueness to what is residency, what is GME, and certainly how it works. So it's not, uh, people kind of get medical school and they get medical education, but this uh, apprenticeship, this uh, uh, period that occurs after, that so many of us who've been through it or understand uh, the full arc of medical education know is critical, is not well understood. So it's a, as a, uh, a policy issue, and even a political issue, it's hard uh, to get large audiences' heads wrapped around it. I think that's actually one of the challenges to those of us in the GME community. When I was a resident, I recall vividly my um, uh, program, my department chair, I can see the room, it was after a noonday conference. I don't know what the topic was, but he said famously, more residents, water in the soup. And what that meant, of course, was residents didn't cost much, come go, not a big deal. It's diluted a little bit. And of course, those are the days when residents didn't make much, not that they make a lot today, but more than then. But that casual notion that was prevalent at that point certainly is not with us today. Uh, residents are monitored much more carefully. The uh, rules and regulations are much tighter. Uh, they are uh, a cost center in terms of salaries and related expenses. Teaching is more explicit and needs to be uh, uh, treated as a financial issue as well. So it's no longer a water in the soup time. Um, and it's grown. We have roughly uh, 115 or so thousand residents and fellows in the country today. Of that, 75% are U.S. medical school graduates. About 25% are what we call international medical graduates. Of that 25%, these days, about 4 in 10 are U.S. international medical graduates. That is, kids who have largely gone to the Caribbean for their training and come on shore uh, with residency. Uh, of those 110 or 15,000, about 90,000 are covered by Medicare GME, which we'll talk about today uh, in terms of the uh, volume of uh, public support that is out there. Um, and in terms of public support, which uh, ultimately becomes the focus often of policy conversations uh, because those are where potential levers are and where potential costs are to the, the taxpayer, um, the largest uh, contributor is Medicare. GME on the order of about $10 billion a year. Uh, you have Medicaid GME, which is a loose state-by-state uh, -state, uh, investment, uh, very irregular, uh, thought to be about uh, $4 billion a year, but that's, those figures are soft. Uh, there's also uh, the VA in at about $1.5 billion, and HRSA in about half a billion. Uh, so those are the principal federal sources. Uh, you have states uh, irregularly contributing, one hears a lot more today about states dedicating money uh, to GME. But on a financial basis, as far as you've been at the federal level, on a quality and, and substance basis, it's managed uh, through the residency review committees, part of the ACGME, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, uh, that is the accrediting body for postgraduate medical training uh, residency programs. Uh, through the RRCs, I say the Residency Review, Review Committees, which are specific for each of the uh, specialties. So that's kind of the landscape of where we stand today. Um, I think many people appreciate that uh, the residency years are kind of the nerve center uh, for the workforce. Um, it is where people kind of take a stand, geographic stand, specialty stand, 
and many people feel it's where they learn medicine. So it's very, very important, not only in terms of quality and substance, but in terms of the geography uh, and um, policies, uh, ultimate policies, or the ultimate shape of the workforce uh, in the country. Um, in terms of recent policy deliberations, uh, it's an area that doesn't get attended to often uh, because it is complicated, large, uh, and the history of Medicare goes all the way back to the founding of Medicare, but significantly 1983 when the current system of direct and indirect payments, which you'll hear about, uh, was put in place. I won't go into that, it's lengthy, but those are the two components of it. They date back effectively to 1983 with some minor modifications uh, since that time. Uh, in 2012 through 14, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, uh, had a committee looking at uh, the finance and governance of GME largely, and we have with us two of the two chairs of that committee, Gail Linnitsky and Don Berwick, who will probably touch on that matter. Uh, since then, um, the uh, Association of Academic Health Centers has had a program of seven regional conferences that Steve will talk about where they kind of went to the people, uh, GME interested people around the country, and talked to them. The Macy Foundation has had a similar set of regional um, uh, lookbacks or discussions, uh, which have been recently uh, released by Macy, or the summary of that. So those have enlightened the discussion in recent years. So that's a kind of quick summary of where we stand, and we hope this deliberation today will contribute to that uh, in the ongoing sense of uh, uh, keeping the issue under uh, 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 scrutiny of how we proceed, where do we go from here with GME. So I'd like to um, call Steve to the uh, podium. Steve Wartman is the um, third president of AHC, which is a nonprofit association that seeks to advance well-being through leadership of complex institutions that do all the things that academic health centers do. Steve so was previously the executive vice president dean at uh, UT San Antonio, uh, an internist by training, uh, and we're very uh, glad to partner with you and have you here, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for turning out on such a lovely Washington morning. I uh, really appreciate the efforts. Hopefully you'll feel brightened up by the conversation today. Also wanted to acknowledge the streaming audience out there, uh, greatly outnumbering us here in DC. And uh, perhaps you can give us some feedback uh, by email or other methodologies uh, when the session is over. I want to thank Fitz and the Center, NGW, for supporting this. I wanted to again acknowledge uh, the AHC's Director of Government Relations, Kristen Verderami, who spearheaded uh, our roundtable series. And thank the panelists as well for being here. So where do we begin? My view of 20th first century medicine suggests to me that trends in science, particularly in the various omic fields, metabolomics, genomics, et cetera, et cetera, trends in technology, especially advances in artificial intelligence, and our evolving healthcare system, including consolidation of the market and the payment system changing, all these trends I think are creating enormous opportunities for changing the education of physicians. So I read with great interest the July 2014 IOM, now NAM, report, Graduate Medical Education That Meets the Nation's Health Needs. In discussing this report with our members, they felt that the association could serve a useful role because the association represents all the health disciplines, medicine, nursing, allied health, et cetera and thus can offer a larger perspective on the healthcare workforce with the changing healthcare system in mind. Further, and I want to make this point very clear, we have not taken a position on GME. And because we haven't taken a position on GME, we were able to serve as a comfortable, neutral convener for open discourse amongst the various stakeholders. Our members also suggested that convening a variety of stakeholders would be a great opportunity for us to learn about GME beyond the more commonly discussed issues of funding and the numbers of residency slots. In short, we went out on this uh, adventure last year to learn what's out there. We chose to use a regional roundtable format to learn more about the local issues and, of course, to keep the groups to a manageable size. Attendees included our members who were generally deans of medical education or program directors, 
various associations, accreditation bodies, local and regional experts such as state workforce entities, hospitals, and insurance and provider systems. So it was a pretty good group that we were able to bring together. And in all, we had more than 100 participants and 30 states were represented. So let me give you my reflections on this experience. I have to tell you, first and foremost, above all, I was inspired, actually inspired by these roundtables. From the very first one to the very last one, the focus was on serving the patient and the dedication of all attendees to this issue in the context of GME, I feel, was truly remarkable. The sessions were generally outstanding, highly interactive, and very constructive. And it was clear that the attendees, even though they had very diverse backgrounds, were able to work well together because they really cared deeply about the issue, despite their backgrounds. Now, I assume that most of you have read our report. There'll be a short test at the end of the session on that. Um, but here are the six topics that stood out for me as important takeaways and program opportunities. Obviously, there's more in the report, but I wanted to share with you on a personal basis the six things that sort of stood out for me. First were mental health issues. The stress of residency training in a high-intensity, rapid throughput setting creates enormous stress, not just on the residents themselves, but on those who are teaching the residents. It is just so different in the Stone Age when I was a resident where I remember we would, meet, we would admit a patient for what was then called a barium enema. We would admit a patient for blood pressure control because they had a systolic of 160. You know, it's hard to imagine that being the case today. So this high intensity, rapid throughput environment creates enormous stress. I'm pleased to see and learn how our programs are responding to this stress. There are many, many uh, things that are being done early warning systems, special counseling, all kinds of preemptive things uh, that I found very gratifying. But I will tell you, more needs to be done in this area of mental health. The second thing that leaped out was the need for the creation of new partnerships in conjunction with residency training programs. Some examples might include other community and provider systems that are providing important contributions in health care in their region and certainly the need for better connections to the private sector, especially tech companies that are driving many changes in healthcare today. The stuff that tech companies are doing is truly remarkable and are going to become the instruments that we use to practice in the future. And the residents need much deeper exposure and connections to that. Third, training for team care specifically interprofessional education and practice. I think there's a general consensus that care now and in the future will be largely driven by teams of health professionals. And this increasingly complex care environment, you have to utilize these teams efficiently and effectively. And a recent survey of ours showed that many of our members are quickly moving in this area. So interprofessional and team care, I think, is an important component. Fourth, and this is interesting, the need for more programmatic flexibility for each resident is desirable that span the continuum of medical school and residency training. This was very clearly articulated in every roundtable. How can we customize training earlier for our residents? We might get some efficiencies in time and cost as well. Uh, and this was a big discussion to in introduce more flexibility into the curriculum. And what about new skills, such as data analytics, working with increasingly sophisticated artificially intelligent platforms, and communicating complex probabilistic outcomes to your patients? You know, when Watson or its equivalent spits out a list of 50 things or 20 things or five things, all with a probability, whether it's a diagnostic test you want to do or whether it's a therapeutic option, and it's 92.1% of this and 52.5% of that. How do you wrestle with that? How well is your training in probabilistic theory? And how well can you communicate in the face of uniquely human complexities? I think need to be a big part of the curriculum. Fifth, 
rural and urban communities, their needs continue to be significant. In every single location, no matter where it was in the country, this came out. This means increasing the placement of residents in environments where they eventually will be practicing, a thrust that needs to occur. And sixth and finally, the thing that stood out for me is that programs are truly working hard to innovate and provide solutions. It's remarkable how hard they are working to do this. But they need more support to do so. It's a hard job, and it's a resource-intense job that they're doing. So they need more support to do so, not only with funding, but also with the aligned efforts of all these various stakeholders that I alluded to earlier getting involved. I can tell you all today that for more than 10 years, I was on the front lines as a residency training program director. And what did I learn from that experience? So much. But I think the main thing that I learned as a residency program director is that residency training, in my opinion, is the most formative period in a physician's training, the most formative in a physician's career. Why do I say that? Because it's the time when the transition from being a student to a health professional takes place. And this is a transition not just in knowledge and skills, but in emotional intelligence and so many other factors involved in confidence and competency to care for patients. It's a critical, critically important time. And today, our residency programs are challenged more than ever to enhance and adapt their curriculum to meet the changing healthcare needs of patients and their communities. Funding is critical, absolutely critical for them to do so. GME must be viewed as an essential investment for the health and well-being of the country. So in conclusion, I'm very pleased to co-host this session today, and I look forward to a highly interactive and interesting discussion amongst panelists as well as with the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I neglected to discuss the format today. Uh, our speakers are going to each speak for about 10 minutes to give a, just a, a bullet of concept or idea perspective. Uh, we hope then to have much of the latter part of the program for open discussion, first with the panel and then with the audience. So with that, we'll move to our next speaker, Don Burwick. Don, I suspect, is known to many of you. He is currently the President Emeritus and Senior Fellow of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. His CV lacks, lacks the information that he was, in fact, the founder of the IHI, an institution which had, has had enormous effect throughout both the practice and educational community and continues to do so today. Uh, Don is a pediatrician by training, spent his early years as a clinician at Harvard on faculty, uh, came, uh, has become really the, uh, the godfather of the quality movement in this country. The two IOM reports, now NAM, uh, that he was behind or helped a great deal with, uh, which were um, crossing the quality chasm was the second, air is human is the first, which both put the issue of quality on the table and then uh, began to deal with it uh, in crossing the quality chasm. Don, we're delighted to have you here. I neglect to say he was also uh, the co-chair of the IOM committee on GME that met these last years as described. Don. Thanks so much, Fitz. Uh, thank you all and thank you for those of you who are connected um, virtually. Um, I, it's a pleasure to get to join you and discuss the report. I'm going to, I think, be a bit of a historian here. I'm going to show you what led up to our report, and then my colleague, Gail Walensky, is, I think will review with you the recommendations of the report and some commentary on that. Uh, I want to thank Steve for the chance to be here and also for his leadership um, in this field. His response to the report has been highly constructive, and the dialogue he's been encouraging around the country is we, we couldn't have dreamed of that. So thank you, Steve. And a special word of thanks to Gail. Gail Walensky was my co-chair uh, for the IOM committee. Gail and I approach policy from somewhat different angles, but it was an absolute delight working with Gail to lead this amazing uh, committee. And I learned a lot from her and cont continue to. We had a wonderful committee. Fitz served on it. And uh, I, I want to tell you at the start, the committee was a very broad spectrum group. Uh, politically, it ranged from quite right to quite left. We weren't sure, Gail and I, when we started where we would end up, but we ended up with a unanimous report and a committee that was able that had the maturity to work through some very difficult issues on uh, policy and um, policy recommendations. It was it was a wonderful experience. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do quickly is describe the history of the GME setup as uh, Fitz began to talk about it. 
a summary of where the status quo is that led to the, uh, to the appetite for the report, uh, the charge to the committee very briefly and what we were sort of asked to solve, and then some comments on goals, and I'll explain that when I get to it, and then Gail, I uh, hope, will review the recommendations and, where, and talk a bit to the future. So for those of you that don't know, just to review, the history dates back to the Title 18 and 19 of the Social Security Act uh, in 1965. Um, somewhat surprisingly, wouldn't necessarily have thought it would be part of the creation of Medicare or Medicaid, um, the, the, uh, the funding of general medical education, postgraduate residency education, was put right into the law. Um, it, to orient yourself to what, what was going on, remember Medicare in 65 was passed as primarily a hospital program. It had very little to do with ambulatory care. It did not include any prevention at all virtually. Uh, in fact, Medicare was not supposed to cover prevention. It was a way to fund hospitals. And the GME uh, component was consistent with that. It was, uh, the idea was to take money, federal money, Medicare money, and um, support the training of, of uh, physicians in hospitals. Uh, it was physician focused and the conduit uh, for, for the money was the hospitals that teach physicians. So we have a hospital based funding program to support the training of physicians in hospitals. Um, the formula migrated as Fitz said in 1983 I believe the, the basic current formula was established. It includes two elements, direct and indirect funding. The direct funding is supposed to be used directly for the salaries of uh, residents in training. And the indirect is supposed to represent a calculation of the excess costs that accrue to a hospital because it's training people. The thought, it thought was it's more expensive to run a hospital when they're trainees in it because they're less efficient and there are, you have to invest in supervision and, and other elements of care um, that teaching costs money. Uh, the number of positions was limited, capped, and so it's a zero sum, set up as a zero sum system when someone wanted to add residency, someone else had to decrease unless that was changed by regulation. There was no accountability whatsoever in the law, nobody reports to anybody, uh, and there was no uh, contingency. That is, the, the, in the law, the hospital got the money, end of story, not got the money if anything. Um, the administrative function was nested within the agency that ran Medicare, first Social Security Administration, then HICFA, now Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and in CMS, there is an office that doles out the money. It figures out the formulas and arranges for the money to be given to, to the hospitals. Uh, those are the basics. And uh, we can talk about that more and please ask questions. Uh, Gail probably knows a lot more about that than I do, as does Fitz. So where are we today? Today, or at least as of the last data our report used, which is 2012 data, uh, we were giving out in this country about $15 billion of federal money to support the training of physicians in hospitals. Uh, most of that's Medicare money, two-thirds of it, 10 billion, 9.7 billion goes through Medicare. Uh, the states are allowed also to support uh, training through Medicaid, and many do. Um, and so that's another 3.9 billion. So, so figure it, 10 billion Medicare, 4 billion Medicaid. Then the Veterans Administration is what, 1.4, I think, billion. Uh, and HRSA gives out some money for supporting training in health centers. Uh, there's some, there are a couple of other sources that are not included in that total Department of Defense, importantly, uh, which does training. Uh, but the, the core here is think of it as about $15 billion, about $10 billion of Medicare money. Uh, that is the status quo. Uh, it's still hospital-based. The money goes out to hospitals. Um, even as care and training move into ambulatory settings, the way an ambulatory setting gets the money is through a hospital which gets the money from Medicare and then doles it out to the ambulatory setting under certain rules. Uh, still, there is no transparency required. There's no contingency attached to the money and no accountability for the expenditure of the money. Indeed, as our committee explored uh, this, trying to trick the money, it was quite remarkable how little is really known about the pathways that the money follows, um, even within hospitals. For example, it is not at all clear how much of the money that a hospital gets actually goes to training and how much is absorbed as uh, cross-subsidies or overhead uh, payments in the hospitals. Um, another factor of the status quo is the original indirect medical expense formula, the IME formula, which is, I think, about 70% of the total. It's larger than DME. 
was based on, for, on a formula that was supposed to estimate the, the overhead that a hospital accrues because it's a teaching hospital. That formula has been called into question severely. It was last updated uh, a couple of decades ago, I believe. And a MedPAC, uh, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, specifically uh, an analyzed the uh, amount of, I of IME and estimated that it's at least 50% in excess of any plausible accounting of what the excess costs to a hospital are from training. And MedPAC has taken a firm stand that, that for what, whatever policy avenue you want to follow, it's not the case that the current IME expenditure, in fact, uh, is a true representation of the cost of teaching. The other thing about the status quo compared to that 1965 charter for the GME payment is that care has changed. And Fitz mentioned a couple of changes. They're in the report. Just to recite a few, and we could go into great detail. First, and importantly, the sites of care have changed. The hospital-centric system, it remains hospital-centric in this country, but a lot of the what care that used to occur in hospitals now occurs in other settings, ambulatory sites within hospitals, ambulatory sites in communities, practices, and even now on the, on the web. Uh, as Steve said, it's team-based care now. The, the focus in 1965 was on the training of physicians. There was nothing about teams and nothing about other professionals to be covered by the, by the, by the uh, expenditure. Uh, Medicare was set up as a hospital-based acute care payment system. That has changed. Uh, but the care system has changed even more. Uh, we now have a care system trying to orient itself much more to prevention and to social determinants of health and, and uh, chronic illness and behavioral health care. That was not true in 65. Uh, the, the, the use of contingency in payment uh, is not brand new, but it's since 65. Uh, we had a cost plus payment system. The hospitals were paid what it cost them to give care plus a little more. That's not gone, but it's, it's eroding today as we move toward value-based payment and the concept that the payment is supposed to be payment for something, for performance, for outcomes, for health, for quality. <clears throat> uh, the internet, the web, the electronic health record has arrived. Uh, there is no, nothing contemplated in the 1965 statute and subsequent regulations to take account of the, the new environment for care that doesn't involve visits at all. Um, Advanced practice nursing has come, along with other uh, uh, professions that, that uh, parallel the physicians. That was not contemplated in 65 and still is not a beneficiary of any of the GME support. Uh, knowledge management has changed. As uh, Steve said, you know, the, the young, I, my daughter finished her training a couple of years ago, and she carries around her, her iPhone and, and, and actually gets more accurate information than I ever could out of my own brain. And I guess the ethos has changed. The, the, you know, we are in an era, for better or worse, in which accountability, metrics, uh, testing, uh, measuring what we do, and, and uh, responding to the findings has uh, become the, the way we're watching healthcare. Uh, that wasn't true in 65. I guess also I'll say that the goals have, been, have migrated and probably changed. You'll find in our report of our committee, a uh, pretty strong embrace of the triple aim, better care, better health, and lower cost through improvement as, as the social need. And although no one thought in our committee that GME is the only possible lever on that, the, the concept was that the filter through, the, the lens through which to study graduate medical education and investments today might be the degree to which we are pre preparing physicians to help achieve the triple aim. Um, as, as well as the integrated care that's needed to do that and, and the integration of behavioral health care in this era of accountability. So what were we asked to do? Our committee was charged to report on financing and governance and by inference accountability of the graduate med medical education system. And uh, although there's a great deal to be proud of, the, you know, this is the system in many ways is the envy of the world. People, people believe that we're training our physicians well and most come out technically very competent. Uh, the, the implication of the charge of the committee is that it, it's, it's not a system configured any longer for the present, let alone the future. Uh, it is an embedded funding stream which the, the hospitals have learned to count on, to assume uh, simply will arrive. Um, it is opaque. 
uh, no one, not even the hospitals, appear to know exactly where the money goes that come in through the stream. So it's not, it's not a traceable, it's not, a, it's not an auditable um, pathway for the use of resources. There is no uh, external form of accountability or policy oversight or governance of where the money goes. The mechanics within CMS are purely, they're just mechanics. There's no policy element. And as I said, there's no contingency for the, the, the giving away of the money. Um, it's based on a premise about care design, hospital-based care design that no longer matches the actual, where actually where care is given. Um, and it, um, it's based in amount on a what is now, I think, a fictitious uh, calculation of the overhead costs of training. Uh, difficult to assess because of the opacity. We, it's, not, it's not that we know what the costs of training are, it's that it's very difficult to find out. And, and to, to mention what Steve said, there's no actual direct support for innovation. It's not clear that, the, that as, a, as a policy tool, the $15 billion is spent in such a way as to encourage um, uh, needed, targeted uh, innovations in the preparation of, uh, of professionals. All that said, although the charge of the committee reflected concern that that status quo is not actually what we might want if we're going to spend 15 billion public dollars on GME, everyone on the committee is extremely, was extremely uh, aware that the system has become accustomed to it and a lot depends on it. And there was a great concern in the committee that anything we recommended needed to be dealt with in, su in a respectful way such that if we're recommending changes, there'd be a soft landing that we can not do violence to a very, very valuable national resource that has l learned to behave the way it does because of the way it was set up. A couple of other issues that, and then I'll s close. Uh, it is evident that the GME funding uh, system as we currently have is a subsidy system. It subsidize, subsidizes non-GME related activities in uh, important hospitals and particularly safety net care. The way it all works out is that it's, it's very likely that the $15 billion helps support uh, care and outreach to populations that may tend to come to some teaching hospitals uh, and otherwise would have trouble getting their care. Um, and uh, the other, not elephant in the room, but a large animal, would be uh, a kind of overarching question, which is, is this the way to use public money at all? Why, if we were starting from scratch now, if we just had the health care system and someone showed up with a bill in Congress and said, let's pay $15 billion to support the training of doctors who, end, after all, will end up at very high levels of income compared to, to the rest of the, um, of the, uh, of the labor force, uh, how would that play? Uh, why would we do that, pay for the training of doctors in, as opposed to any other needed profession uh, in our country? So the foundational logic has to be dealt with. Uh, there's another very important uh, debate that maybe Gail will comment on it that our committee engaged, I learned a lot from it, about the economist's view of the payment themselves. And the, econ the, the view in the committee was, you know, hospitals probably make money on trainees, otherwise they wouldn't have them. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a very edgy comment. I think if uh, we had long discussions there, and I, I say there's a, plausible, uh, there's a plausible case to be made that that's true. Goals, so, so where we organized our thinking was, all right, let's treat GME as, a, as an instrument for the accomplishment of uh, creative and important public policies. Uh, what would we want to spend $15 billion getting done? And could we then ally, align the committee's recommendations with those goals? There were six goals that are articulated in the report. The first is, the obvious one, match the physician workforce, competences, directions, uh, choices, match the physician workforce uh, to the social need to lead and participate in triple aim care, care that achieves better care, better health, and lower cost. Second, encourage innovation so that uh, new forms of training and development occur uh, faster than they other, otherwise might to better accomplish aim one. Aim one is to have a workforce capable of achieving the triple aim. The, f the third uh, goal was uh, do this in daylight, that uh, the expenditure of public funds like that should be uh, transparent, uh, accountable, and there should be evident stewardship uh, of the uh, resources in, re in which the 
use of those resources is judged according to the proper uh, management of money and achievement of the goals. The fourth was that there should be oversight and of two forms, one policy oversight and the other is operational oversight, so there's diligence. The fifth is to maximize value. Let's, let's work on waste uh, and, there, and or particular forms of waste, especially a very complex payment system. And finally, that there be a soft landing, that, uh, that, that whatever changes are made mitigate the risk of damaging an existing program which people count and that's quite valuable. Uh, of course, in this current uh, new regime coming at us now, we, we don't know where this report will land. Uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about that, but that's what we, that's what set us over the recommendations. And I think Gail can walk us through what we suggested. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> Gail Linsky, as you've heard, was the co-chair of the committee. Uh, she also, I didn't, didn't point this out, she was in charge of what was then HICFA, the Healthcare Finance Administration, now CMS, during the first Bush administration, 1992, as Don uh, served for a year plus uh, in the uh, current administration, uh, so both have had that perspective. Gail also spent time as a counselor to the White House and to the President, uh, and has um, worked at senior levels of government, really is uh, the go-to person in many, many uh, circles around town uh, in regard to health economics, uh, and certainly Medicare and Medicaid. She also served as commissioner of the World Health Organization's uh, Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and she chaired MedPAC, you've heard, uh, the Oversight Committee really for Medicare uh, from 97 to 2001, and uh, committees before that that were in the workforce area. So Gail, you come to us as a, as a uh, resident scholar in the, all these matters. Uh, thank you very much, Fitz, and uh, thank you, uh, Don, for setting this part of the talk up uh, so nicely. <coughs> I wanted to give you uh, just a little bit more color about our um, uh, activities. Don uh, alluded to the uh, composition of the committee and, and some of our deliberations, and then I'll, I'll move to the uh, uh, actual recommendations, because I think it will uh, help you understand uh, how these deliberations occur, uh, the context in which they occur, which I think it's important uh, to both understand the uh, attempt by uh, the National Academy of Medicine uh, to provide a wide uh, group of uh, skill sets in taking on an issue like that, uh, and uh, also some of the challenges that you face uh, when you have this very diverse uh, group of individuals. Uh, it was uh, quite a large group. It was about 21 uh, individuals. Um, as Don indicated, uh, there were co-chairs. Uh, that's less common, not uh, unheard of, but less common. Uh, in this case, uh, I guess Victor can talk about how it seem, seems to me. It, is, it definitely has occurred, but uh, frequently you have a chair and, and vice chair. Um, but because uh, we understood, the um, Academy understood uh, when it was being set up, uh, that uh, the issues cover a broad range of issues, and the fact that uh, Don and I uh, have uh, intersecting experiences, uh, but also bring uh, different uh, experiences uh, in terms of our discipline approach that is different, our experiences in uh, different uh, administrations, uh, but the common understanding uh, of uh, Medicare, which is a, and Medicaid, uh, which represent uh, major sources of funding for graduate medical education. Uh, the simple majority of individuals uh, were uh, physicians uh, covering a, a range of specialties and, and some uh, directly involved in graduate medical education, some having uh, somewhat less of a, uh, an involvement uh, in graduate medical education. But there also were uh, a number of other uh, areas that were covered, uh, nursing, of course, uh, physician assistants, uh, different uh, social uh, science uh, areas. Uh, there's one other uh, economist that uh, was on. Uh, and in doing that, uh, attempt to provide a broader perspective uh, of graduate medical education, uh, the role that it's played and the role that it uh, might play going forward in, in the future. Uh, and given this very diverse uh, set of individuals, 
uh, it was uh, quite a challenging experience uh, to come to agreement in an area that many have, and particularly many of the people uh, on our committee, many, certainly many of the people uh, listening in the audience, um, have known uh, because it's been around for all of their adult or professional lives. Um, and that is really a, a challenge uh, when you want to take a step back, uh, and as uh, Don had mentioned, begin with this concept of uh, first principles. Why exactly is it uh, that we think this is a role uh, for Medicare? Uh, and is it a role that uh, should continue going forward? And um, to many physicians, uh, that might seem to be uh, an odd question to ask uh, or a peculiar place to start. Um, but I think it was important uh, for us uh, if we were going to take a, a wide view about why exactly uh, does the government do this and uh, should it continue. And it was really in the context that this is quite an unusual role for the federal government to take uh, with regard to this type of um, higher education and even more unusual in terms of how the money was distributed, uh, which was to institutions uh, and not to the individuals being trained. And, and so uh, we, as part of this, uh, uh, discussed the issues that uh, Don had uh, mentioned, that it is not something the federal government does for undergraduate medical education. Uh, it's not something the federal go government does uh, in anything like the same way, either in magnitude or uh, continuous funding uh, for other areas that are either very important uh, to society or that are regarded in, in some shortage. We've had a lot of discussion uh, the last decade about the importance of STEM, science, technology, engineering, uh, and mathematics. Uh, and uh, that is uh, nothing like uh, GME occurs uh, in that uh, area. Um, so uh, we did get through that discussion, and I'm going to share with you the three reasons we, we uh, decided that um, we would recommend continuing uh, GME funding uh, at least for the next 10 years, uh, after which time we suggested uh, that the... Uh, Academy, then called the Institute of Medicine, uh, reconvene a group like this or some other group, Victor, this is uh, our charge uh, to you back, uh, to discuss whether or not uh, the kinds of reforms or uh, other reforms had occurred uh, that would uh, bring a similar conclusion or a different conclusion uh, at that time. Uh, and, and the three reasons that uh, led our committee to be comfortable saying, although this is a very unusual role that the government has taken in funding graduate medical education, that we believed uh, it should continue, uh, was first the delivery system, uh, we think, we hope, uh, is in the midst of significant amount of change. As, again, as Don mentioned, uh, there has been a uh, sustained push um, uh, by uh, the department and the administration uh, to help move uh, the way healthcare is delivered to a value-based system. Uh, this is also occurring in the private payers, uh, but it is not a, a small effort and will go on um, for some amount of, of time. Uh, the second is that uh, while um, it is uh, not large relative to hospital revenues, uh, it has played uh, an important role, uh, and we are hopeful that this Medicare funding uh, can be used to leverage some of the changes that we think are needed uh, in terms of training physicians so that they will be more relevant for the 21st century uh, workforce, uh, working in teams that has not uh, occurred uh, in the past the way it is occurring now, uh, providing uh, the majority of the care outside of the hospital walls. Uh, recognizing the importance of multiculturalism and that uh, the patients uh, that will be seen cover um, a wide uh, spectrum of backgrounds and, and need to be treated uh, as such. Uh, so we thought that uh, this money could be important in trying to leverage that. Um, 
And third, because of the nature uh, of uh, attaching this to Medicare, that is uh, entitlement funding, uh, that it provided a level uh, of stable funding um, that is frankly quite hard to come by uh, in the government. Um, and so uh, for those reasons, uh, we thought it was important uh, that this continue, um, but we thought it was appropriate uh, for the same kind of questions that we asked, uh, both uh, why were you doing this and what could you say now about how the funds had been used, did it appear to be uh, it was having a, a better impact in terms of helping uh, to shape the kind of workforce uh, that needed to occur, particularly among uh, physicians, than seemed to have occurred uh, over the last couple of decades, and that 10 years would be approximately uh, uh, the amount of time uh, to take uh, another look and see whether or not uh, the recommendations that we had made uh, or other changes uh, such as they may occur uh, would have produced um, a, an outcome uh, that would either say uh, this job has been fundamentally done uh, and uh, it could now be uh, curtailed or it needed to continue or it needed to be um, moved uh, in some way, but that uh, we recognize this was uh, a question that uh, should be asked again. Um, what we recommended uh, was uh, five uh, different recommendations. Uh, we said first and foremost uh, that uh, we thought the current level of Medicare funding of graduate medical education adjusted for inflation uh, should be continued, but we should phase out the current payment systems and gradually replace it with a performance-based system. Uh, as I assume uh, all of you know, uh, there is nothing uh, in the program now that links uh, to uh, performance-based measurement, uh, and that this, this is where the uh, rest of the uh, delivery system is at least aspirationally uh, moving uh, toward, a little slower than some of us would like to see, but nonetheless moving in that direction. Um, we thought it was important that there be a policy uh, infrastructure that had some funding uh, attached to it, uh, and we suggested establishing a GME policy council in the office of the secretary in HHS, um, and that there also be a GME center uh, within CMS, which of course is responsible for actually distributing the funds. Um, we know there have been um, various uh, groups um, in HHS, but we were concerned they were not at a high enough level uh, that they would actually uh, be involved in some real policy direction. Um, and uh, while uh, we understood other funds get involved in, in uh, graduate medical education, and they ought to be um, uh, used and determined uh, at what, under whatever infrastructure uh, is appropriate for them. Uh, this, after all, is federal money, and therefore uh, having some determinations be made about how best to distribute federal money uh, was appropriate and needs to occur at a high enough level in, in HHS uh, to have that occur. We, of course, debated uh, in government, out of government. Uh, it's government money, uh, money therefore uh, there's um, a certain uh, attraction to both the Congress uh, and a certain legal needs to have it have at least some uh, portions of it be attached to government. But we thought it was important to have it uh, be a part of uh, HHS uh, deliberately. Um, we have made a recommendation uh, that there be a single GME fund, but that it have two subsidiary funds rather than the two pieces that now occur, uh, that now occur the direct and indirect. Um, the major funding, major amount of money and the major activity would go in what we called an operation fund, um, and that would distribute support for training physicians, uh, those that are currently approved and funded, uh, and that there be a second fund, a very important fund, called a transformation fund, and it be used to pilot alternative ways to distribute GME, 
uh, ways to evaluate performance measures for GME, uh, ways uh, and initiatives uh, to think more innovatively uh, about uh, how GME programs might work. And so while the bulk of the money was to go in the operations, we assumed somewhat arbitrarily, but roughly start with 90% of the money uh, in the operations and um, uh, up to 10% uh, uh, in the uh, innovation fund. Uh, and that uh, over uh, several years, that be allowed to grow, uh, assuming that the kind of proposals that came in warranted uh, additional funding, maybe as large as uh, to 30% of the total, if warranted. Uh, and then over a number of other years, it come down uh, probably to the 90-10, but we were open about uh, whether 90-10 was the right distribution. This was not something uh, that we thought uh, was clear when we start, uh, but gave us a, a rough measure of how we envisioned it. The vast majority, roughly 90% of the funding, continuing to support uh, positions, um, but that a non-trivial amount of money be used to think about uh, both how we could have better metrics uh, if we're going to move to a performance-based system, how we would know whether or not we are uh, training uh, a physician uh, workforce that is uh, better able to meet some of the deficiencies that, that had been uh, noted, and to actually try uh, out some pilot programs. Uh, and to the extent they were successful, uh, both uh, the residents and the money would move back into uh, the operations uh, fund over time. So that meant uh, that we would be going to uh, a single payment, uh, and it would go to the organization that sponsored uh, GME uh, on a per resident amount, uh, and that ultimately there would be a performance-based uh, measurement uh, system Used, but we recognized that it did not exist uh, to date, and that was part of what uh, needed uh, to occur. Uh, and finally, um, states now sometimes use some of their Medicaid funding uh, to support GME as well. New York, in particular, has been very uh, active, uh, but a large number of states uh, have uh, used some Medicaid money uh, to supplement their support um, of GME. Uh, and we thought uh, that that uh, should continue um, as they wished. Uh, it is done uh, at the state's uh, direction, but we thought that the kind of uh, accountability and transparency that we were suggesting exist for uh, the Medicare-funded GME uh, also uh, ought to be there as well, so there's a better sense of uh, what you're getting for your money. Um, we certainly recognize that trying to get a workforce uh, appropriate for the 21st century um, is going to require a lot of different policy changes. Uh, we're under no illusions that this is something that GME by itself can fix. Uh, a lot has to do with um, how uh, physicians uh, interact with other uh, individuals uh, providing care, uh, reimbursement. Um, both in the private and in the public uh, system, uh, and a variety of, of other issues. Uh, and, and we were mindful that uh, if we really want to see the kind of changes we hoped would occur, uh, changes have to occur there as well. Um, but of course, uh, uh, this was an area that we were asked uh, to opine on, uh, not these other areas. Uh, and uh, as I've said, while um, at one level, uh, it's not so much money relative to Medicare. Uh, it is very unusual uh, in terms of what the federal government uh, does between Medicare. Those two are close to the $15 billion when you have a little money from the VA uh, and other parts of uh, HHS. Uh, and so we thought it was really uh, important that everything that could be done uh, to help uh, this amount of money produce the kind of workforce that would be appropriate um, occur. Um, uh, we have, of course, noted uh, after many discussions with people on the Hill, uh, participating in some um, conferences that Steve Wortman uh, had uh, run, that uh, not much uh, has happened. And we were mindful this is a politically 
uh, charged area. We thought it important that unlike some of the commissions, um, we were not suggesting reducing the money. There had been one in uh, 2010, uh, Fiscal Responsibility uh, Committee, that had suggested uh, absolute reduction uh, in these amounts. Uh, and in many ways, uh, many of our recommendations bore a similarity uh, to a MedPAC report uh, that also uh, took about the kind of money we were talking about uh, for our transformation fund, our innovation fund. Uh, and they were recommending uh, something that would be uh, quite uh, comparable, but with less change uh, to the base funding uh, than what we were uh, talking about. Um, again, uh, we are hopeful that uh, there may be uh, some opportunity uh, to have these discussions. Uh, we thought then, I continue to believe, uh, that in the current fiscal environment, uh, the likelihood of getting more money, which is, of course, most of the advocates uh, want, uh, is highly unlikely. Uh, but keeping the money that's there uh, was important. We just would like to see it used in a more uh, productive way. Uh, one final word, if you actually would like to see how us economists view uh, who pays for graduate medical education, uh, Amitabh Chandra and I, and a physician who was working with Amitabh, Amitabh was the other um, economist uh, uh, with me on uh, the study, a very fine uh, economist uh, at Harvard, um, wrote something called The Economics of Graduate Medical Education that the New England Journal uh, published as a perspective in May of 2014. Um, we were actually reiterating points that um, uh, many of us economists have made in the past, myself and Joe Newhouse, when we were both at MedPAC. Uh, the advantage we had is we had more and better data uh, to show how clearly the uh, empirical data uh, fit the uh, economists' uh, assumptions and theories. So if you want to see what us economists believe about this, uh, go take a look at the perspective. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually going to suggest a change in order here. I thought if Karen Fisher went next, it might be good. Victor is our sort of uh, uh, wise man who's going to look at the whole Discussion, if that would be okay. Sure. Is that okay with you, Karen? And you're saying, Fitz, I'm not wise. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Compared to Victor, I would agree with that <laughs> assessment. Uh, Karen is the Chief Public Policy Officer at AAMC. AAMC, you will recognize the organization that represents not only medical schools, but teaching hospitals, uh, and has been an important force for quality and development in medical education in general, graduate medical education for sure. <laughs> Uh, Karen has a very interesting career. She started, uh, well, she, she, she spent a, a decade, I think, with the AAMC and then went to the Hill, uh, where she worked for the Senate Finance Committee for four or five years uh, and uh, really uh, saw all sides of uh, the health care debate, but certainly the education part of it and the GME part of it. And has returned now to the AAMC, uh, wiser from her days on the Hill, um, and she will give us some perspective from both those uh, journeys and the WMC itself. So Karen, thank you. Terrific, terrific. Thank you, Fitz, and thank you to you and Steve for uh, inviting me to be here. I'm glad to be here and uh, glad to see that might even, we might even have a couple students in the room, which is, uh, which is terrific. Um, Fitz mentioned I was on the Hill with the Senate Finance Committee when the IOM report came out, and it was interesting, and there were a lot of discussions that, that occurred on the Hill. And we're always appreciative when the Institute of Medicine, or now the National Academies of Medicine, take on a topic, because it does allow for a longer uh, discussion and more thoughtful discussion on any issues. And uh, the National Academy has done a lot of great work, and, and, and uh, we feel very good about that. Um, I'm also appreciative of the uh, focus groups that Steve talked about and the work they did because I think sometimes we get at the national level and look at data and numbers and it's important to go out there and actually see what's happening, what the educators are doing, uh, what's happening with education at the resident level, of which we can't see at the national level when we just look at the data. So it was very useful to hear what Steve had to talk about from the focus groups that, uh, that the WHC uh, did and I will m note one point you talked about uh, sort of the resilience and uh, the mental health of residents and the AAMC where I'm part of and I'll talk about in a minute held a leadership forum last year talking about resilience 
and the mental health of both residents and physicians and faculty physicians. And we also agree that's a very, very important area uh, that needs to be addressed and are working on that and working with others in that area uh, to look at physician resilience, uh, residency resilience. So I'm with the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, we represent uh, all 147 schools of medicine, as well as about 400 major teaching hospitals, including v 51 VA healthcare systems. Our teaching hospitals educate about 80% of the residents uh, in the country. They represent about 5% of all hospitals in the country. I think one item that's useful to point out from the get-go is that not every hospital in this country uh, educates residents or other health professions. We've decided as a society, or for whatever reason, that it seems to get concentrated, and it's concentrated in about 20% of the hospitals in the country. So uh, to the extent that uh, some people may think that uh, educating residents is a moneymaker, 80% of the hospitals aren't aware of that, I, I don't think, uh, and, and should be told. Because in fact, and I'll come back to this, um, I would respectfully say that I would say our teaching hospitals do not see it as a moneymaker uh, at all, and I'll wa walk through that a little bit uh, in that front. Uh, we appreciate, uh, and, and I wanna, I'm happy to continue to talk about the Institute of Medicine, but I also think it's a useful time as we head into a new administration, new Congress, to talk about the future and where we need to go in, and go in that front. But I want to build upon a little bit about these payments that the Medicare program has done since, I think Don mentioned, 1965. And it is true there are two payments. One is the direct graduate medical education payment. It's explicitly set forth in statute that was intended to help offset the costs that teaching hospitals incur for the education of residents. And those costs are the stipends that residents receive, the costs associated with supervising faculty, the overhead costs, the GME administrative office, uh, all those types of activities that occur with actually educating residents. In 1965, hospitals were taking those on, and when Medicare took over, Medicare said, we see those as reasonable cost. Now, what Medicare did say was, but we, as the Medicare program, are only going to pay our share of those costs. You may have a total amount of shares, but we think in fairness to the Medicare program and our beneficiaries that we pay our share of those costs. So for the direct graduate medical education payment, uh, the share is based on how many patients are treated at the particular hospital. If the hospital has 40% of Medicare patients, and our teaching hospitals treat a lot of Medicare patients, then the teaching hospital receives roughly 40% of those total GME costs. Now it's actually a little bit less than that because um, the formula for how it's done it results in a little bit less. But what that means is that 60% of those costs are not covered by Medicare. So Medicare does not pay the full amount, it pays its share. Now as others have mentioned, Gail, et cetera, the Medicaid programs have stepped up uh, in a number of states and they also pay their share. But there still leaves a significant amount of money just on the education costs that are uncovered. And so where are those costs covered from? Well, they can come from a myriad sources. For the most part, they probably come from commercial payers. So that when teaching hospitals negotiate with commercial payers and they look at their total cost, they negotiate a payment that probably factors in a little bit more because they have educational costs that are not covered by Medicare or Medicaid in that front. The, in, in 1997, I'll raise right, right now, Medicare decided to put a cap on the number of residents it would support. So it would pay its share, and it would only pay for the number of residents that were being trained in teaching hospitals, uh, at, were training at the time, at, at, of what they were training in 1996. So for the last 20 years, Medicare has only paid its share of the cost for the number of residents that were being trained in 1996, a complete freeze on that level. Now the number of residents has increased, some because some teaching hospitals have just decided to go over that cap because for their communities and for their localities they need more, res more physicians and so they decided to take on those costs to the extent they could afford to. And in other cases there, were some, there, are, there is the ability of non-teaching hospitals to take on residency training and become teaching hospitals uh, in that front. 
But that's a policy issue that we need to think about going forward is how long do you keep that type of freeze uh, on in terms of Medicare support. So Medicare on the direct GME side pays its share of the cost based on how many patients a hospital treats. The indirect medical education payment came to be in 1983 when Medicare re-looked at how it was paying for clinical care. And in 1983, Medicare decided to make a prospective payment for every case that was treated by every hospital. And for, it was a per case payment. They recognized at that time though, that teaching hospitals had costs that other hospitals didn't have. And those included standby capacity, uh, more complex patients that the payment system really wasn't capable of recognizing, et cetera. So they provided an add-on payment. So that is an, a percentage add-on that goes on to every Medicare case. So, for, so consistent with the direct GME payment, Medicare only pays its share of those extra costs by, by providing for an add-on to each Medicare case. Now the value for society is, is that a lot of those activities benefit everyone whether it's trauma care, whether it's burn units, whether it's uh, preparing for Ebola, where many of those centers were teaching hospitals. Um, some of that is funded through the Medicare program. And it is hard to tell and to indicate exactly where that money comes because it is an add-on to a per case payment in that arena. Uh, Medicare also provides additional payments and historically has provided additional payments to, I think Don mentioned, to safety net hospitals of which teaching hospitals uh, largely tend to be. That also is a percentage add-on payment. It's called the disproportionate share payment. Just like IME, that's difficult to actually identify exactly where that money goes, but we know it goes to providing care for the uninsured and for the uncompensated care. And the same thing that the IME money goes for the myriad purposes that teaching hospitals play in their society in that arena. Now, when I look at the future, of Medicare, and when we look at it, uh, we sort of have to look at Medicare seems to be playing its role uh, in, in providing the type of top-notch physicians that we need for the future, in, time, in terms of on the clinical side, providing that type of capacity to take on unexpected uh, emergencies, trauma care, et cetera. And then the issue is, what happens though with those costs that are uncovered? Teaching hospitals, Medicare margins are negative. They're negative, they're not making money on the Medicare program. Their overall margins, thank goodness, are positive, but they're less than other community hospitals. And I think that's what we have to remember going forward as we think about policy uh, in this front. Uh, the IOM provided a lot of information in its report, and it was very thoughtful, as uh, Gail and Don have pointed out. Uh, the AAMC, has a very thoughtful response. I, say, I can say that because I wasn't there at the time when they did it, uh, but I read it uh, this weekend, and it's very thoughtful. So I encourage you that to read both in tandem if this is an area of interest to you. And maybe after we're using all these acronyms that this may not be of interest to you after you're done. But if it's of interest to read both of those reports, it's important. Do we need to innovate, I think, is one of the themes of today. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we're looking at a new delivery system that is changing every day, whether it's looking at more population health, whether it's looking at the genome, uh, whether it's looking at the complexity, uh, end-of-life care. Uh, G GME and medical education overall must change and must continually change. And you heard Steve talk about the educators on the front lines who see that and are doing that. And we see that in our organization as well. We also see the accrediting bodies who credit graduate medical education also recognize that and as part of their accreditation requirements are saying, we need to see more of this activity. So you're seeing it happen. Do we need to see more of it? Absolutely we need to see more of it and I think that's going to occur. Because as Steve pointed out when he saw the educators on the front lines, those educators became educators because they want to produce physicians who are well prepared and prepared for the 21st century uh, in that front. Um, finally, what I would say as we enter into a new administration, I'm sorry if I took more of my time, as we enter a new administration, the one area I wanna <coughs> point out is, uh, Gail mentioned and others mentioned about st stable funding. 
and the recognition that right now the Medicare funding is important because of the role it plays. Obviously, I agree with that. But the other area that we need to keep an eye on is the VA. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the VA and care for veterans and re-looking at the VA system to ensure that it's providing high-quality care to veterans. We very much agree with that and, and are supportive of that. But I think a lot of policymakers don't recognize the role, and it was pointed out earlier, the role the VA plays in physician education. And as we look at the VA and look at reforms to the VA, I think it's incumbent upon the medical education community to make sure that policymakers understand the important role that the VA plays in our physician workforce, both for veterans as well as for everyone. We have a new administration. We have a new Congress coming forward in 2017. It's a critical time, I think, for uh, health care, generally, if you're following the news, <coughs> and for medical education. And I think this is a critical time for medical educators to make sure we educate our policymakers on the role of this funding and what medical educators do to prepare a workforce that arguably produces the best health care in the, in the world. And I think if we can educate on that front, it will take us a long way in terms of the next administration, the next Congress, to understand what we can do to keep this country great in terms of health care. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so Victor Zhao, who is our designated wise person, with uh, uh, due apologies to the rest of the panel, Karen in particular, um, is the eighth president of the National Academy of Medicine uh, and is the Chancellor Emeritus uh, and uh, James B. Duke Professor of Medicine at Duke University. He's past president and CEO of the Duke University Health System. So somebody who is an owner of the system who's had to work with GME in many capacities, Victor certainly has those credentials. Uh, previously, he had uh, been chair of medicine at Harvard and at Stanford, and in the research field, uh, uh, both uh, cardiovascular health and uh, human genetics have been key to a, a very impressive career of work in this area. Um, and uh, he comes to the National Academy of Medicine at a time of change of name and positioning for it, and has done a lot of work on that, as well as, uh, I believe this was the first report released under your yes. presidency. <laughs> yes. So we feel somehow we're the firstborn. <laughs> however that may play. But thank you for joining us and thank giving you. us some insight. Good to name it as my firstborn. <laughs> I was there in the delivery room, but I was not really the father. <laughs> 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 but exactly. I, I've, exactly. I've since I adopted this child and loved this child. <laughs> uh, I do want to thank uh, Steve Wadman and uh, Chris Mullen for asking us to have this discussion. And uh, as pointed out, I'm not here as the president of NAM, because you heard the two co-chairs who really did a super job, in my opinion, that is really asking the critical question of what's the future of GME. Actually, I'm here as somebody who would represent someone who has a good amount of experience with GME, uh, first, as, as you heard, as chair of the Department of Medicine at Stanford and Harvard, so we ran big GME program as someone who's gone through the GME training, as someone who's a father whose daughter went through GME training, but also as, at one point, the uh, CEO of the Duke University Health System, which we received the money for uh, DME and, and uh, IME. So I think this conversation is really important. I do say we're missing some aspects of this conversation, which are the trainees, which are the educators, which are the people on the ground. So while I do believe strongly that this conversation is really pushing us towards creating a more transparent, more strategic, more accountable system, and there's no debate that we need that, uh, the question really is, would it serve the people who really need it? That's the question. So I have some thoughts. I didn't really write a speech, but I have some thoughts. First of all, GME remains to be one of the most important functions that we have in health and medicine. No question about it. Think about scores of generations of people in trained, people like myself, Don Berwick, the people in this room, and what it has produced. It hasn't really failed miserably, but it does need more strategic and accountability. In fact, when we look at our system, 
uh, you know, people are beginning, the rest of the world is beginning to say, we'd like to be like, more like the United States. Why? Because from my experience at Duke, we started medical school in Singapore, the Duke and U.S. Medical School, very successful. I very quickly realized our students are going to be learning how to become physicians and uh, providers. And most of their learning, in fact, occurs at the GME level. So as Steve said, actually, GME is something that's so critically important and vital to the formative ages, I think you use it, that I think that, you know, we have to look at how good it is and where we are. Certainly, an ACGME now is moving this into several countries. Qatar is one of them. They all recognizing perhaps the British system of more like an apprenticeship is not working. That in fact, a GME system that has better uh, expectation, uh, better standardization is the way to go. So it has actually been a successful model to be set. I think what's really great about the GME model, in my opinion, not only are the trainees who are just phenomenal and the collegiality they form with each other. I certainly can tell you my best friends are ones who I trained together in residency and uh, internship, <laughs> et cetera, but also the very dedicated uh, faculty and teachers. And there, they frequently under-supported, under-resourced, and really passionate about trying to do the right things. GME has been successful in the sense of continuing improvement and learning. And of course, our current system, particularly through ACGME, does create a set of structures and expectation standards. That's all good. But there's lots of challenges. I mean, my question is, what are the trainees saying? What are the educators saying? What's administration saying? And uh, you know, you need to take all this, this debate and these things into account. Are we serving the society? Are we serving the trainees, et cetera? So I'd like to add some of this thinking to this conversation. Challenges. I think everybody would agree that it's taking way too long to train. Just way too long. Uh, one of my daughter's friends, who is now a chief resident in thoracic surgery, has been out from medical school and training for 10 years. You know, if you look at the number of years usually taken, it's taken so long and it's shaping a lot of choices and career choices, decisions about what people are gonna be doing, particularly if you consider student loan and all the issues that at the most productive part of your life, you're working really hard and paid very somewhat poorly. And it was said, is this service or education? I think that tension's never been resolved. I guess it's both. So when people talk about unionizing, you know, we are workers, or are we trainees? And how do we get paid because we're trainees at a certain level? I think that for someone who's gone through all this, I say this is a tension that's not gonna go away. We're gonna have to find how to balance the tension. Certainly, if you think about the service side of things, uh, no doubt, no matter what's said, these are highly skilled, highly trained individuals who are paid less than if you were try, try to find equivalent people to provide service. So while there's a saying about are they making money or not, I would say that they're certainly, they're contributing clearly to the service at a level which I think if one were to, I was telling Gary, we have looked at many times as uh, someone around the health system. What if we have put nurse practitioners in the place of trainees in these services and I can tell you the economics look very different. So that being said, it's not cheap labor because they're learning, and they're learning more and more and become really great physicians, of course, and other health professions as well. But I do think there's a whole tension between service versus education. How to achieve that is the issue. Many hospitals have gone to, un teaching hospitals have gone to uncovered services because there's not enough residents and you think about well, how do you cover those services at night and the need for resources to do so is a continual challenge that one, one faces. Residency work hours. You know, some 15, 20 years ago, actually maybe 15, when I was chair at the Brigham uh, Women's Hospital, one of our faculty, actually Chuck Sizer, was the one who pointed out about all the issues about 
sleepless uh, truck drivers, all the way he started looking at house staff and, of course, recognizing the errors that are being made in people who are not getting enough sleep, and came very quickly a series of policy changes that restrict the number of hours. I'm sure you know about all those things. Has it been successful? I say it's highly controversial. And the evidence, I think if we do it again, I would ask people to make policy to do it in a pilot phase, collect the data, and then learn from it and move forward. So that's another level that you need to think about when you start talking about money and where the resources is going to go to, is how do you actually make sure that you have enough people or that, in fact, those residency hours make sense. That, of course, leads to this big debate between are our trainees learning, you know, patient skills, you know, doctor-patient relationship, professionalism, do they have enough time for it? Are they become shift workers going home at a certain time? And so on and so forth. Tremendous amount of tension in this area that needs to be discussed. And if you talk to faculty, increasingly they have much less time to teach under tremendous pressure in terms of workload. And importantly, the way in which now rotations are being set with attendings. When I was in training, we would have an attending for at least a month you get to know that person, you get to socialize, spend time with it. These days, they do for one week because they got to go back to do all the other stuff. And so that relationship is, as we say, being eroded. And I think clearly we are worse off for it. Big issue, of course, is well being resilience. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But I think suffice to say, if you look at all the recent data, it's uh, hair raising. You know, the most recent one about medical students, about 25% have evidence for burnout. But if you look at residents, residents, I think you're probably close to 50%. If you look at practicing doctors, suicide ideation, uh, true suicide, and burnout, tremendous problem. I think this is all in the context of what we're talking about today. How are we going to be able to make sure we have resources to support right, to support residents and the right work environment to enable them to be successful. The last point is, I think there's an overall lack of strategy in GME. I mean, I don't know what a strategy is except everybody getting through accreditation and getting people out. There should be a national strategy to look at what do we need and how do we provide resources for this. And this is why I think the IM report is important, asking for strategy because Resources can support strategy. Without resources, you can talk all you want. So I'll come back to that. Now, but there are lots of opportunities, don't get me wrong, because if I think about, as Steve said, digital age, simulation, our information, it's unbelievable, the opportunities, and interprofessional education. And uh, certainly more and more has been said by Gail and others, social determinants health, learning these skill sets learning these competencies, leadership, learning high-value cost-conscious care, <clears throat> learning about informatics and data analytics. All that stuff, I, d I think, are here and will be in the future. So the question I ask is, how do we find time and resources to support that? There's where, back to the report, elements, someone has to free up those dollars. So when I was at Duke, I was very proud I actually created a number of very innovative programs. First of all, we created a thing called Management Leadership uh, Pathway for Residents. We took people who were interested in leadership and management and let them train, you know, in not only in the basic clinical work like everybody else, but add on election time, elective time, and an extra year to get skill sets to be MBA, management, working with senior leaders, et cetera. We also created the high value cost conscious care learning health system you know, residency where we begin to embed the learning about cost conscious care, but also the use of analytics. And we even created a master's degree program for summer residents in master in clinical informatics. And I created a GME fund. But where did that money come from is the question. So I agree transparency is not clear. As a chancellor, I find money from different sources. Did I think about IME as a source first, 
or did I think about somewhere else first? I think what we did was say, this is important, but there are hospitals that may not have those resources to do so. So when, Steve, you talk about innovation, who's going to fund and drive the innovation is the question. A more strategic way of looking at it versus a one-off way yeah. of opportunity. Yeah. Uh, administration issues. No question the IME and DME is a big issue. As the recipient of, so I ran the health system. We have hospitals. The money comes to hospital, not the health system. But I was CEO. And because what do we do with the money? Well, as been pointed out by Karen, uh, clearly the direct dollars are not sufficient. I put down there's a lot of informal costs everywhere. And of course, with ACGMEs, more regulation, more regulation, you have to find money to support those staff, right? And where do you find that money from? So money are kind of being pulled from different sources to make it work. I think a more systematic way is going to be more preferred, in my opinion. And so um, IME. Well, I can tell you an IME, it was distributed into cost allocation, at least where I was, in looking at all the different pieces. So as Karen said, it's meant to support the other activities, but sometimes I think it gets away from the idea that it could be used for, in fact, education. So the site for training and teaching support is very important. So when I think about the ambulatory sites that we used to run and many ambulatory sites and the, and the faculty, well, you know what? They are the later, you know, the favorite child's hospital. It comes kind of in trickle down to these sites. And there's got to be some thinking about more systematic, particularly we want to go towards more ambulatory teaching and more primary care. And of course, faculty. You, you would know that every faculty who teaches clinically now would, would tell you that they are underpaid and they have tremendous attention. We need to resolve that issue of how to support faculty teaching. And finally, regulation. Uh, well, I don't want to sound like the new administration, but we do have a lot of regulation and some of them needs to be looked at very carefully because it burns a lot of resources and people's time. So what do, you, what do we need to do address? I'd like to finish by saying I can think of five areas. Some, by the way, challenges are clearly extrinsic, and some are intrinsic. The intrinsic ones we should fix. The extrinsic ones is where we're going to debate how we can change these things. So first, I think, issue is learning. We're going to have to figure out, you know, some way what, we ha what our res trainees have to learn how much time to learn, how much volume to learn, and of course, what kind of competencies besides skill set. You know, increasingly social determinants of health, high value cost conscious care, and many others. We have to decide in learning service versus education. What's the right balance? What is the economy on this? And what are the work hours? And I totally agree that we need time for residents and trainees to pursue their interest and innovation. A lot more flexibility is needed. And I say that because I come from a program, Brigham Women's Hospital, used by Peter and Brigham, where our training director have tremendous ability to look at uh, people's interests and support it. And in our training program, you know, we have people like Mark McClellan, Risa Lisa Mori, myself, but I think about people like Paul Farmer and Jim Kim. Jim Kim is now the president of World Bank. He was a hospitalist, but he was an anthropologist. And he was interested, he and Paul, on issues related to Haiti and under-resourced. And was using that time, free time, to do this before they actually make this, you know, now a scalable operation. It's because the training director says, no problem. You love it? Go for it. Economists and our midst, no problem. You know, you like it, pursue it. But the current way of resource and regulation greatly restricts that possibility of giving people that chance for innovate and pursue their interest. So that leads to this point number two. So one is learning, two is regulation and flexibility. Well, I think it's absolutely true that we need standards and structures. 
I always think that when you create standard structures, you drift everybody to the mean. So you reduce the possibility of creativity, et cetera. How do we make that kind of balance? And the issue of innovation, how do you bring innovation in where at the end of the day, how do you measure the success of innovation? And there, I think, needing some system to be able to say that's what we want to do is important. Workforce distribution. A lot's been said about you know, primary care, specialty care, and of course, as we know, lifestyle specialties. And how do you actually achieve that balance and create the kind of experience that people want and incentivize uh, you know, people going into, particularly in primary care and serving in rural areas? Actually, Fitz and I had a, we had a meeting at Macy Foundation and at Duke, remember? That was discussed, of course, discussed many other venues as well. And of course, we need workforce planning. We need to workforce planning and then have the right policy to help to achieve that workforce for this country. Uh, point number four is resource and financing. I think we really need to address resource financing, support for the trainees, for the educators, for faculty, for the sites of teaching, not just the hospitals, and of course addressing IME. Uh, I do think it's important to address that. And I think reworking the funding mechanism is certainly one way. It's one instrument. It's not the only one. But of course, it helps in trying to use the tools, which is financing, to drive some changes that's very much needed. No question. And finally, of course, work-life balance, well-being resilience. As Karen said, uh, WMC and uh, AMA and many others have been very active in thinking through this so that uh, many of you may or may not know the National Chem Medicine will take this on uh, together with 37 other organizations now. We're launching, we had our first meeting in July. We are officially launching this in January to address the issue of workforce resilience and clinician resilience and well-being. The idea is not only to learn from each other the issues related to the challenges that people, that leads to burnout and suicide, et cetera, but also to really try to do root cause analysis. It is certainly my hope, and I'm not saying that we're gonna do that per se, but I think I will, we should, that ultimately we'll have a report like to ask human because the workforce is in fact training are the future workforce and patient safety and quality are highly dependent in fact, the welfare of the people who provide the care. So I hope that when we get down to this issue, we'll address issues such as we've got at the table payers, vendors of IT, government, educators, professional society, you name it. And hopefully together we'll try to make a difference. So those are my thoughts uh, as somebody who's uh, gone through uh, GME training, but also been responsible for it, but also been responsible for the other side. And so in, nine, in 2014, indeed, this was my first report, and I th read it and I said, okay, I think I'm going to lose all my friends who are running hospitals. <laughs> and I think where we are today is we are in for a good debate about what needs to be done, but I strongly believe things can be, can still be the same as Right now, we're going to have to go forward and make changes. Thank you. Good. We promised to open this up, and uh, our panel has been generous in their thoughts. I'm sure I could open up to the panel and we'd spend our remaining minutes uh, in a good debate. But I, in fairness to you who have come to join us, um, we'd, we're going to open up now to questions from you, and we'll take those as they come. And, work the panel in, if that would be all right. We have a microphone here in the middle uh, for anyone who wants to uh, ask a question, make a comment. Do make it brief. Tell us who you are. <clears throat> David Rines. I'm actually the uh, ex-chair of Cogni, but I'm not here with that. I'm actually, what Victor said, I think, brings up a point that none of us have really addressed as well, and that is this push for RVUs, where our faculty are now all saying, why do I want to teach? And our deans have to come up with, where am I going to get that resources for? I think that maybe is a much bigger threat than any of us 
uh, have understood in the past, it wasn't one six years ago. It surely is one in 2017. That is the pressure on faculty to earn their way as clinicians uh, crowding out any instinct uh, to teach. Is that the essence of it? Yeah. Comments well, from? Uh, we were yeah. actually, Victor and I were just having a slight uh, sidebar on this. Um, the, the transformation dollars that we had talked about, uh, one of the uh, questions that you could uh, think about is uh, on trying to um, uh, look at uh, uh, allocating the hours of, of faculty. Is there something that can be done that would make more sense uh, to, it would be the kind of issue uh, this is not really the frontal issues of uh, measuring uh, the outcomes of uh, the uh, teaching program, but it is close enough uh, that uh, thinking about uh, how to take this on uh, mm -hmm. could be considered as one of the uh, innovation uh, studies. The broader question uh, that many medical schools are, are facing, uh, which is that they no longer have uh, the base funding uh, for all of their clinical faculty the way they had a couple of decades ago mm -hmm. uh, is a, a broader issue uh, in terms of uh, whether or not too many universities are trying to be all things uh, to all people and whether or not there needs to be more uh, focus of having some research uh, institutions and, and some that are um, uh, primarily uh, training clinicians, uh, but not uh, heavy R&D, uh, and whether or not uh, over time, for a variety of reasons, uh, how um, the uh, academic health centers, medical schools, uh, have taken on various functions is sustainable. Uh, with the amount uh, of money. I, I know that there are a number of medical schools uh, where the uh, faculty members basically have to support themselves, uh, and that is just, I mean, it takes on a whole different issue uh, that's irrespective of whatever uh, the allocation of uh, GME dollars does is a, a much broader question. So competition uh, for, for time in all senses, but certainly as it relates yeah. to education is a big deal. Please. Is Julie Peterson. I'm a family doc and I'm the, one of the health policy fellows at the Robert Graham Center. Um, one of the big issues in GME right now is the AOA AC GME um, merger to a single accreditation system. We've talked a lot about rural healthcare and sort of trying to decentralize maybe some of our medical <coughs> education. What do you all see as ways to support kind of our rural and community based? Um, osteopathic programs as they're transitioning to the ACGME. So there, there's a comment in there which is to remind us that the systems at the graduate level are merging mm -hmm. in terms of accreditation, <coughs> but lurking behind that is will that have impact or what is the situation vis-a-vis -vis promoting teaching and uh, practice in rural health? Fair enough. Thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's such a, a broad <clears throat> issue uh, that goes to what kinds of delivery systems make sense to envision in rural areas and therefore what kind of healthcare professionals uh, do you need uh, to support them. Um, about two decades ago uh, when the uh, uh, primary access programs, uh, hospitals programs started, uh, they started out as uh, I can recall uh, with very stringent criteria about who, what kind of hospital would be uh, designated, how close other hospitals had to be uh, in terms of miles uh, and times, uh, and the various functions uh, that if a hospital couldn't make it as a full service hospital, it might make in a reduced form uh, in terms of providing a, a link uh, for their communities and a linkage to the um, uh, rural referral centers. Uh, over time, what has happened is because there's more money involved, a uh, tremendous amount of political pressure uh, for lots of hospitals that uh, would not seem to meet the common sense 
need of what it means to be uh, a uh, principal or, or uh, critical access hospital uh, have uh, gotten legislative changes introduced so that they too uh, get to be one of those. Uh, and it, it's, I mean, it's a reminder about how what can start out as a perfectly reasonable strategy uh, seems to get changed uh, over time. So uh, I'm, I mean, I'm very, the, their broad question about what makes sense for people living in rural areas, given that we have modern transportation needs, uh, do we think about uh, having basic medical services present and getting people uh, easily moved in and out as they need more complex with information yeah, systems, the, and what does that do to the economics of the community, uh, which does not always like so the notion of what that suggests. Rural health raises a series of institutional challenges. Um, the Teaching Health Center program, which I think people are familiar with, has been the one innovation recently yes. that tries to take teaching to rural areas or to community-based areas and change the paradigm uh, of approach a bit. And it's struggled, as we know, politically. It's part of the ACA, which is due to become history here for shortly. How that will all play out uh, is, remains to be seen. But I think making that connection, particularly in this day and age when the political thrust seems to be to worry about those folks and the forgotten folks, many of whom live in rural areas that would be benefited by not only rural programs in general, but in regard to teaching, teaching health centers. So I think that's a new coming possibility. Can I just say, yes, frankly, I, I, I do think as we go into a new administration, a new Congress, the programs in Title VII, a lot of the grant programs that are focused on rural areas, diversity, pipelines, uh, are critical that we maintain that support and encourage the new Congress and the administration to continue that funding uh, because it is an appropriations level of funding, so it's up for funding every year. And again, we have to do an education process about how important those programs are, and particularly for rural areas. Just a, just a quick note on that. You know, there's a lot of innovative stuff being done, and things are, uh, people are trying a lot of different things, like this merger. We don't know really what that's going to mean. But in the absence of a national health workforce strategy, it's all kind of hit and miss, and it's not cohesive, and it's not harmonized with each other. Uh, you know, we supported uh, the uh, National Health Workforce Commission, which I think was part of the ACA. Uh, it was a distinguished group of people. They were going to try to get their arms around this very comprehensive and difficult issue. <clears throat> of course, they never got a penny in funding. <laughs> so I think in the absence of a National Health Workforce strategy, some, it's hard to see all these issues coming together. Okay. Ed. Thank you. Uh, Ed Salzberg, GW. Um, Given all the political changes and the administration change, how likely is it that GME will be a topic of focused discussion? And if it's not going to be a topic of focused discussion, how likely is it to be impacted by other discussions about changes in healthcare financing and organization? So quick answer, who's, uh, what do your crystal ball say? Uh, I would say, uh, given what's been discussed so <clears throat> far, um, I think they're looking at larger uh, discussions. But I am concerned about some of the issues relating to the Affordable Care Act, uh, coverage issues, uh, some of the discussions relate around Medicare and Medicaid, because as I discussed, uh, those funding streams for teaching hospitals, Medicare and Medicaid is 70% of the population. So changes to those programs can have fundamental impacts on these institutions, which ultimately translates into what happens to the patients that are served, Medicare and Medicaid, Ed. So I think <clears> we're paying very close attention to those larger issues because they're ultimately going to affect the health of the patients that our, our, members, our members treat. I, I agree with Karen, Ed. I think that, uh, I think that a specific uh, spotlight on GME is unlikely, uh, at least in the near term. But uh, it's, it's very um, uh, liable there'll be collateral damage because of some of the other things that Karen uh, discussed. So that's what we need to look out for. And, and Medicare, not so much. Medicaid, Medicaid yes. Yeah. 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 Well, it may also be, you mentioned collateral damage, but it may also be an opportunity as people look at changing financing. And I think Karen's point, make sure when you're thinking about that, you think about what does that mean for graduate medical education. Correct. And just a quick add on comment. I think <clears throat> we're going to see every bit as much um, turmoil or observation and analysis as we saw with the construction of the ACA as we will with the deconstruction, whatever is going to go on. It opens up the box. And while it isn't clear what's going to come out or how that's going to play, I think we're in for a period of intense health policy debate nationally. And where that goes 
partly we need to be clever in terms of where we'd like to see it go and try to educate and raise questions. Please. Um, so I'm Linda Thomas. I'm the president and CEO of the Wright Center, which is the largest national teaching health center consortium. And I guess my question and um, just perspective from the trenches is um, the limitation of a national strategy funding mechanism um, within just CMS. Um, I think some of the greatest innovations are going on connecting the dots of CMS and the VA and HRSA. Um, into what is a community-based conversation to own workforce production as a public good, um, similar to safety net resources and to draw those linkages. So I guess I'm interested in the IOM's perspective about potentially bringing it to a higher level than just CMS, um, knowing that we need to shrink hospitals, even though they need to be awesome. I'll say that, uh, first of all, I think the Teaching Health Center uh, thrust is fantastic and uh, f fully supportive, and I think the committee also feel feels that. We, we, we wanted to increase flexibility. The idea that all the money goes through teaching hospitals means that it's hard to get it to innovative new sites. That's one of the reasons for the transformation fund. Um, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I think we're thoroughly in, in sync with, with, with your point. Um, right now, the, the way that uh, alternative sites get the funding, is, it makes it very fragile. It was why I, uh, I emphasized uh, although it may have been too much code for those of us who worked on this, uh, that it, uh, the money should go to the site where the actual training occurs. Uh, we think there are many uh, occasions where uh, it is not uh, only uh, at the teaching hospital that that uh, occurs. It certainly is there as well. Uh, but we were, um, uh, as you can imagine, it's made sure that we considered uh, the teaching health centers as a strategy where uh, you have a different kind of a training uh, program. The, the uh, good news uh, with regard to um, area like the uh, rural uh, teaching centers uh, is that the uh, rural caucus in the Congress uh, remains very strong. And so I think some of the issues uh, that you've raised and also that uh, Fitz raised uh, are not likely to get lost uh, in whatever kind of uh, changes occur. Um, the collateral, the, uh, collateral damage uh, issue that I worry about is uh, if most or all uh, is shoved through the reconciliation uh, process, uh, that um, sure. those areas that sure. would not be ruled as germane uh, to the budget uh, can, uh, cannot be redone. Um, they can be defunded, but they can't be reconfigured. Notice that in our recommendation also, we elevated uh, the policy oversight to the GMA investment to the Secretary's office, which yes. was very, very uh, conscious we, uh, to make sure that that includes other agencies besides the I think this is um, just one addition. You know, the GME modality of the Teaching Health Center was put into the grants world, and that brought us into the federal auditing yes. world with mm -hmm. time tracking and better understanding of how much time is really spent seeing patients versus teaching and how do we integrate in safety net systems with that sweet spot. So I think there's a lot to be learned. Um, just from the federal mandate for auditing that came along with the program in terms of accountability and fiscal transparency. But. Thank you, Linda. I'll allow one more question. We're at our time. Make it very brief. Uh, Robert Levine. I'm from FIU. Uh, as the Associate Dean for GME, my job is to help develop new programs. And uh, one of my concerns, which you've uh, briefly addressed, which I think needs to be focused on more, is the flow of funds. So uh, you've talked about uh, creating new paradigms, and we, uh, we're developing new training programs in South Florida, uh, and there's no funds to support the private physicians who are willing to step up to the plate. And, uh, and we know that there's uh, the indirect funds coming to the hospital, but there's no pass-through to the physicians at that level. Yeah. Similarly, in the community uh, system, where we could potentially have outpatient programs, and we've already started one in a psychiatric program, uh, the funds flow to the physician to support them while they're being squeezed to generate more RVUs. The funds are not being identified, I think, fairly that there, are, that there is support there. And I, I, I know that uh, Dr. Walensky mentioned having accountability, and I think that's a big deal that we haven't focused on enough. Good. I think we can take that as a, as a constructive comment. Is that fair? Thank you. We appreciate it. You must sit in a hot spot a lot of the time. All right, I want to thank our panel. It's been terrific. We got a lot on the table, a lot off. Uh, Amity was good. 
ideas were good. <laughs> the future's uncertain. We all share that. Hopefully this will contribute to that. Thanks, particularly to AHC and to our Workforce Center. And uh, we'll see you all soon.